everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today is the video where I prove to you that I own clothing that is not just black t-shirts. I do actually own some color. Um, but in all seriousness, today I wanted to introduce you my non-fiction November TBR pile. Um, I am not following the YouTuber who's doing the non-fiction November readathon. Um, non-fiction November has existed for a very long time on other platforms that I'm on and that's what I'm following so there are no prompts in this video there's nothing like that in fact I'm not even participating in um, no non-fiction November um, there's nothing like a readathon or a theme read or prompts to make me not want to read something so if you might notice in my videos I've been reading a lot of non-fiction lately but I probably in a sense of irony probably won't even read any this month just because like I said if you tell me it's nonfiction November I'm like all right let's read some fiction so um, that's that but I do I did want to share what nonfiction books are on my actual physical TBR pile and there's a bit of a theme to these um, because I like to read several books on certain topics but um, to begin with, one of my favorite um, genres of nonfiction are travelogues. Um, I love travelogues. I love. Um, I think I think the first the first book I ever read that was a travelogue was *The Roads to Sata* by Alan Booth, which was this. I think it turned out to be three thousand kilometer. It was he did this three thousand kilometer um, walk along the North Ridge of Japan. And it was his interactions with the Japanese people and especially at a time where there weren't that many foreigners in Japan yet. And he spoke Japanese fluently, but he would talk about these these um, sort of encounters with these very local Japanese people because north of Japan, it's not exactly Tokyo, right? So he would have encounters with these people at the end and he would be like, he would be speaking Japanese with them. And he's like, uh, he'd say, oh, I need a room um, for tonight to sleep in. And they'd be like, no English, only Japanese, no room. And he's like, well, that's okay, because I'm speaking Japanese to you in Japanese. And they're like, ah, oh, no English, no English, no English. Just because, like, the barrier of seeing this non-Japanese um, face really just caused them to freeze and be like, no, 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 we don't speak English, we don't speak English, even though he's speaking perfect Japanese with them. And it has just all these, like, delightful interactions at the time, and then... He really explains the beauty of the Japanese countryside and then, and then just like his walk through Japan and it's absolutely fantastic and it's one of my favorite um, travel logs. Um, so since then um, it's become one of my really really favorite genres and actually um, I have his second book on my TBR pile called Looking for the Lost Journeys Through a Vanishing Japan and with this one he's doing a walking tour of just the north of Japan. Um, so Aomori and, and all that region. And actually I am a hundred pages through this. I started reading this back in March um, and obviously was enjoying this. I mean this book is really really fantastic but I put it down just because that's like right when the pandemic was getting, um, it was shifting from okay this is serious, um, our lives are gonna change and at that point I had to put it down just because my mental you know, um, just like everybody else, my mental um, health was a little bit off. So I did have to put it down. I'm, I, I'm, I am going to have to restart it again. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, Alan Booth is just amazing. And um, this is, I mean, I've, I've, I've owned this book for, I think, maybe like seven or eight years. I don't know, but I've had it for a long time. And the only reason I haven't read it up to now is because I know it's going to be so wonderful. I don't want it to end because the thing is that, unfortunately, Alan Booth, um, died quite young, so he only has those two books, the um, the Road to Sata and Looking for the Lost. So he only has these. So once I've read this, it's done. I have nothing left to read from him unless I reread them. So that's why I've been putting them off for so long. Um, but it's it's it's. I mean, he's he's just so wonderful. He's just comedic and beautiful, and he really appreciates Japan in a way that's just absolutely lovely, absolutely lovely. So this is um, one of the travel logs on my um, TBR pile that I'm looking forward to. Um, another one is a new author to me, and I found this author off of a list online where I looked up the best travel logs um, to read. 
and this one was on several lists and that's Robert McFarlane's um, The Old Ways and this is a sorry it's very bright today outside um, so this is The Old Ways which is his walk around the British Isles so same sort of thing it's gonna be very explorative of nature and um, the the bliss that comes from walking and exploring in your area via walking um, sort of taking your time to really capture all these moments in your life and this is highly highly recommended by several several websites and um, some people I, I really trust on um, library thing which is the forum that I use I don't use Goodreads I, I use library thing and um, the people I follow on library thing I mean they've all have incredible things to say about this so I know this is gonna be excellent so that's Robert McFarlane's The Old Ways it's gonna be excellent and the last travelogue I have is Sam Mao's Stories of the Sahara. And I got this, I hadn't heard about this before, but I was browsing the travel section in um, Kinokuniya in Shinjuku here in Tokyo. And I saw this book. And the thing about like a lot of travelogues is that there's a definitely a heavy preference to white men writing about their travels. Um, that's the most prevalent story that you'll get. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're very, I mean, the authors that I've read so far are beautiful writing with, you know, really appreciative of the areas they're in. But I think there are definitely more voices that could be heard that need to be heard. And so this is actually a Chinese woman's um, um, experience um, in the Sahara, Sahara Desert. So I think this will be a very, very interesting uh, point of view to read. And it's a region I'm not, I mean, other than what I've learned growing up about the Sahara Desert, it's not a region I know very much of, especially under a more modern setting. So I think this will be very, very fantastic. So the next theme is Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so I love reading anything about Japan during World War II. I think it's a topic that needs to be discussed more. I mean, the number of times where people say, oh, I love World War II fiction, it's wonderful, I love it, or I love World War II nonfiction, it's fantastic. And every single time it's about the Holocaust and it's about Germany and it's about the invasion of Normandy and the Allies and things like that. And everybody forgets about the other side of the world that participated in World War II. Trust me, there's a lot to read over here in Japan and it is fascinating and amazing. And there's, I mean, um, I'm definitely going to be doing a video about Japan during the war. It's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I went to Hawaii three years ago for the very first time because funny enough, Hawaii is a lot easier to get to from Japan than it is Texas. So um, so I finally made the, the trip to Hawaii and I was really, really looking forward to the Pearl Harbor Museum because of the Pearl Harbor Museum bookstore. Very, very excited about it. And the Pearl Harbor Museum was fantastic. It was everything I wanted from it and more. It was really, really well done. I think it really showed all the perspectives really, really well. And the bookstore is fantastic. So I, I bought, um, uh, the first book that I bought was At Dawn We Slept, The Untold Story of Pearl Harbor by uh, Gordon W. Um, Prange, who is a fantastic historian and his specialty was uh, Pearl Harbor um, and this book I mean it's it's very big it's um, 740 pages about and I'm about two yeah I'm 200 pages in. I started reading this a few years ago um, I brought it with me on my vacation to France um, but unfortunately once again it's like with the other book I was loving this it was so Oh my gosh, it is so well written and it is remarkable and there's so much to take from this. And the, I mean, the number of ways that the U.S. actually knew that Japan was going to attack and still for some reason, just like due to lack of communication or errors or, um, you know, some people being like, oh, that's impossible, that's unbelievable, or that's never going to happen to Japan, like, or underestimate, underestimating the Japanese, like, they actually could have prevented Pearl Harbor. And they didn't. And then the number of times Japan could have been thwarted um, because they thought they were being all secretive, but it turns out the U.S. actually knew quite a bit about their plan and actually had figured out figured it out um, to a fairly 
good extent like that was just like crazy and just his ability because he really focused like he really gives you the american point of view but he very much gives you the japanese point of view i mean his research research and like the the sources he goes through i mean there's like i don't know almost 100 pages worth of sources just by itself it's amazing <clears throat> amazing and it's written in such a uh, a wonderful almost story like way and it's really i mean it's 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 hard to put down but it is a big book so it's hard to like carry around it's like well i can't carry it to work because it's a little bit much it's a little heavy um so it was really great when i was on vacation but it's it's been hard to like read it since which is unfortunate because this is amazing and um oh, i really want to read it i want to really want to get to it um but yeah this is um at dawn we slept and this is i mean it's so far it's so good 200 pages in, and i'm just i really i i, I want to read to the end it's just it's it's been fantastic um so i also at the pearl harbor museum why well, I, I bought the baton death march which i read um two months ago but these are the other two books that i read um not that i read that i bought from the pearl harbor museum about actual pearl harbor and these are first person um witness accounts which i really really enjoy i mean i love these sort of like expansive um expansive like histories but i particularly particularly like first um first person witness accounts of events so i got i attacked pearl harbor by the ensign kazuo sakamaki the true story told by the midget submarine officer who became united states prisoner of war number one by midget submarine that doesn't mean the officer is a midget, it just means the submarine is small, just so you know. Just, just telling you. Um, so yeah, for, so the very first um, US prisoner of war, very short, um, but I think it's gonna be very, very interesting because he, um, he kind like, it's, uh, how to put it, he actually goes through sort of a, a big change after he was captured and sort of his rehabilitation is actually almost more interesting than his capture um so i think this will be very very good to read and then i also have god samurai the lead pilot at pearl harbor and sorry actually this is not a first person um, witness account because it is written by gordon prange again the person who wrote the same author as at dawn we we um we slept but this is about just the lead pilot at Pearl Harbor. Um, and so, ah, I just messed up. I just messed that entirely up. This is not about, this is about the submarine person, but it's not about the aftermath of his capture. This is about the aftermath of this guy's capture who um, converts to Christianity and then has all sort of, um, um, what's the word? Um, It's just not gonna come to me, but his perspective changes about his role in Pearl Harbor, basically. So sorry for messing that up. But yeah, this is the one where it talks about the actual Pearl Harbor incident and also his conversion to Christianity after. So maybe I should have read the blurbs before starting this video. It's all right, we're good, we're good. Um, the next book I have that I bought is John Krakauer's Under the Banner of Heaven, A Story of Violent Faith. Um, I bought this because I read his Into Thin Air, which is, was his nonfiction about his time on Mount Everest. That book was amazing. The, the way it just discusses like humanity, ego, um, the, the man's like obsession with conquering the impossible and the, the lengths at which we go to fulfill these very selfish desires of ours. I mean, that book was freaking amazing and his writing was fantastic. And his, his um, research is also very, very detailed and very like, I felt um, it's not really, it's not very biased. I think he was very good at considering everybody's um, emotions, feelings, motivations, rules, etc. So I picked up Under the Banner of Heaven, which just to read the bottom on july 24th 1984 a woman and her infant daughter were murdered by two brothers who believed they were ordered to kill by god the roots of their crime lie deep in the history of american religion practiced by millions um so yeah it's basically about Mor mormon fundamentalists and basically their 
here it says they're Taliban like theocracies. Um, so for me, I'm not, I'm very anti organized religion. Um, I'm fine with people being spiritual and believing in something that's perfectly fine. But when it comes to organized religion, I'm very against it. Um, because I think it's used as an excuse to do bad things. Um, and people will say, well, no, it's, 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 um, it's a good way to get people to do good things, but I don't think you need religion to be morally good. So anyway, um, I think this book is gonna be fascinating. I'm really, really excited about, about, about this one. Um, I do have his Into the Wild on my wish list, but that one I'm a little hesitant about buying because I didn't like the movie. I really hated the character. I don't really like these pretentious types who um, sort of avoid all responsibilities and try to like leave their very privileged lives because they're like, oh, I'm so privileged, how awful. It's like, well, no, you're privileged and you should use that to your benefit and also the benefit of others. You can do good with that. Um, so yeah, that one, I don't know. We'll see. But for now, I'm very excited about Under the Banner of Heaven. I think this is going to be very, very good. So the last um, pile is the pile that's the most difficult for me. Um, it's basically about uh, South Korea and comfort women. And basically, I really wanted, I've been, comfort women is a very heated topic still in Japan and still in South Korea. I mean, Japan, South Korea relationships are still awful because of the, the whole concept of comfort women. And so I really wanted to read about the topic about myself. And I wanted a very, a, a good expansive history, kind of like jo what George Prange did about um, Pearl Harbor, like Jonathan D. Spence does about China. I really wanted something like that. But it is surprisingly difficult to find those books. There are no, I mean, I did a lot of research and there's really no, um, no like good general histories about comfort women and I don't understand why. Um, so I found two books um, on Amazon, um, The Comfort Woman by C. Sarah So, uh, Sexual Violence and Postcolonial Memory in Korean Japan. I don't know if you can see the cover. There we go. And then Comfort Women, Sexual Slavery in the Japanese Military during World, World War II, Yoshimi Yoshiaki. Um, because you need both perspectives. So this is a non-Japanese perspective and this is a Japanese perspective. When you're reading history, remember, you need to vary your perspectives. You can't just be all American perspective or all Japanese perspective or all German perspective. You, you need to vary your reading in history. So it's very important to have balance. But I started reading this one and just the introduction, this is very, very academic. It's, a, it's much more academic than I wanted. And the things like just reading the introduction, I was so confused. She, she would write something and a paragraph later, it felt like she was contradicting what she just wrote. And I have, I have to say, I, I, I think I have excellent reading comprehension. Um, yes, I haven't read academic, uh, an academic book since I left college, but it just, I was so confused. The introduction was just confusing. So I put it down because I just, I had no idea what I was reading. Um, so I think I'm going to, I'll be trying it again and just skip the introduction, start from chapter one and hope that it's a little bit more, um, linear. Um of a, not a story, more linear of a telling about the um, role of the comfort women. Because it's it's something I really, really want to know more about. Um, and on Amazon, the reviews, they said it's very highly readable. They said it was highly readable. So I took, I took the dive, I took the chance and bought it. But it's, I haven't gotten back to it because that introduction, it just, it killed me. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? So I don't know. I, uh, I just really wanna know. Um, this one I haven't tried yet. Um, I actually might end up reading this one before the other one, um, because maybe the readability on this one's a little easier, but we'll see. But this is going to be same thing. Um, available for the first time in English. This is the definitive account of the practice of sexual slavery that the Japanese military perpetrated during World War II. 
written by the researcher principally responsible for exposing the Japanese government's culpability for these atrocities. So that's very, very important because there are politicians still in Japan who are insistent that the comfort women either didn't happen or that it was exaggerated or that the women were um, not recruited um, against their uh, own volition, against their will, against their, their own um, principles. So I think this, this will be a good one. So yeah, I think I might end up reading this one because I think the readability is going to be a lot easier. Then the last book, which is another book that I started reading, um, but then had to give up on because once again, it was just, it was not what I thought it was. Um, because I mean, I, I want, I really wanted to read about when Japan colonized South Korea, but once again, there's just not, um, there are not a lot of history books about it. It's just a topic that's not covered and I don't understand why. Um, but that's so, but I bought, um, Assimilating Soul and I think I was actually more captured by the, the cover and I missed the subtitle when I bought this, but again, on Amazon, the reviewer said it was incredibly readable. So I really went based off of, of that. Um, but the subtitle is, so assimilating Seoul, Japanese rule and the politics of public space in colonial Korea, 1910 to 1945. So it's that public space. This, what I read so far, it reads like a book about civil engineering in Korea. That's what it reads like so far which is not exactly the topic I wanted. Um, but I mean, but basically the whole idea of this nonfiction is how, um, when Japan colonized South Korea, how they used this concept of public space to rule over the Koreans and to control the Koreans. So using um, public space by, for example, um, limiting access to, uh, to shrines, um, and temples so that Koreans wouldn't, so that Koreans would instead um, use their faith to pray to the Japanese emperor and not to their own gods and things like that. And then um, public space, how they used it to dismantle, you know, organizations so that South Koreans couldn't organize against the Japanese and things like that. Um, but so far as to what I've read, it reads more like a civil engineering book like the history of civil engineering. So I don't know, I'm gonna have to try again and go back into this. But yeah, so those those last three books are the ones that are much more academic than I was hoping for when I purchased them, than um, much more academic than I'm used to reading um, because I wasn't a history major in college. I wasn't, um, you know, I, I was a science major. Um, so when I read nonfiction, I read based on what my interests are. Um, but I do tend to like more expansive um, histories or first-person witness accounts because I like to really read about the human emotion behind events rather than just like the facts be behind um, human um, behind events. I mean, I still think these last three are going to be very good, um, but I think it's something I'm going to have to train myself to read a little bit. But anyway, these are um, all the actual physics physical books um, on my nonfiction TBR. Will I read any of them this November? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Does it, but it doesn't really matter because they will be read because um, they all sound fascinating and they're all topics that I really want to know about. So yeah, um, hopefully maybe that inspired you guys to pick some of these up because the ones that I started are excellent and the ones I haven't started yet I'm sure are going to be excellent because I think I have, I think I have good taste. <laughs> anyway, um, that's it. So thanks for watching and I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you. Bye.